Hey everybody, welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. My name is Eric Trexler, and I'm going to be your one and only host for today's show. Uh, this will be yet another solo show. At this point, the Stronger by Science podcast co-host Union has walled me off entirely. Uh, as listeners know, I've taken a lot of major steps to accommodate every single demand that they've put on the table, uh, but now there is a deafening silence, and it is truly unsettling. Uh, given the fact that they are completely putting the wall up, not negotiating, not responding to messages, I can only imagine what they're up to. And this is a really, really troubling scenario, which has disrupted my ability to sleep at night. Uh, so as a result, this episode is going to be all about the relationship between sleep and fitness. But before we get into that, a quick reminder that if you like the show and you want to support it during this completely illegal strike, there are many ways you could do that. So first of all, you could like, rate, or subscribe wherever you get the podcast. You could also check out the email newsletter that we send out every Wednesday. Uh, you can find more about that and sign up at strongerbyscience.com newsletter. If you're looking for one-on-one -on -one virtual coaching, you can find that as well at strongerbyscience.com coaching. If you are looking for a discount on your supplements, head over to bulksupplements.com and use our discount code. The code is SBSPOD and it gets you 5% off your order. Of course, you could also support the show by checking out the Mass Research Review or by checking out the Macro Factor Diet app, uh, which we, the Stronger by Science team, co-developed with an extremely talented team of colleagues. Uh, if you want to check it out before you commit, there is a free trial, so you can take it for a spin and see if you like it, and I think you might. Uh, now, to start out here, as we're talking about sleep and fitness, I want to begin by just talking very briefly about sleep and the relationship to just general health and wellness. I want to talk a little bit about circadian biology and how sleep kind of fits into the picture there. So we're going to work our way toward uh, more directly fitness-related topics as we go here. But starting out, I want to begin with just a very superficial look at the relationship between sleep patterns and overall health and wellness. And to look at this, I think it's very helpful to begin by looking at research in shift workers. Uh, it's kind of a unique, what we would call a research model for looking at sleep disturbances and circadian rhythm disruptions and seeing how that might impact health in the real world. So when I talk about shift workers here, I'm talking about people who work in an occupation where irregular work hours are the norm. So for example, nurses, uh, you know, it'd be great if we could all make a deal as a society that no one has medical emergencies after 5 p.m. on weekdays uh, and certainly none on holidays. But unfortunately, we don't have the ability to make that deal. And so we need people who can administer health services and, and provide health care during irregular hours. You know, we can't just shut down the hospital at 5 p.m. and come back the next morning and hope for the best. Uh, same thing goes for occupations like firefighters um, and, and, you know, uh, emergency medical personnel. Uh, there are many jobs where, as a, as a society, we simply need people to be able to, uh, to do these jobs and provide these services for our communities at irregular hours. And so because of that, there are going to be people who need to work uh, some pretty unusual shifts, you know, people who work overnight, people who kind of go back and forth between day shifts and night shifts, and even people who will work, for example, an entire 24-hour shift in a row, uh, which I believe is fairly common for firefighters in the United States. Um, so before we get into the actual uh, health outcomes that we see in shift workers in the research, I want to start by just briefly talking about chronobiology. Uh, now, chronobiology is the, um, the uh, relationship between time and biology, uh, or the relationship between, uh, I guess you would say, circadian rhythms and biology. So we know that chronobiology is very important, and we know that there are many biological processes that are dictated by synchronized, time-linked circadian rhythms. Uh, so some examples of biological processes that occur with some degree of circadian rhythmicity, basically fluctuating on a repeatable cycle throughout the day. Uh, 
hormone levels. So there are some hormones that have these patterns where they elevate at certain times of the day and they go down at other certain times of the day. And we see that repeating in a regular sequence. Uh, so for a number of hormones, uh, a physician might say, hey, when you get this retested, make sure you go in the morning, you know, because we need to compare a morning value to a morning value, not a morning value to a night value. Uh, the sleep-wake cycle, of course, uh, is going to be uh, something that is is very directly impacted with some uh, circadian rhythmicity. Uh, you know, we, we don't just kind of have this random assortment of times where we go to sleep and wake up naturally. We tend to fall within a pattern, and of course, we're going to talk about that more. Uh, core body temperature does tend to have some fluctuation throughout the day in a repeatable cycle, uh, and even immune system activity as well. So there are a number of these different biological processes that are intrinsically linked to circadian rhythmicity. And like I said, chronobiology basically is just in an umbrella term that refers to uh, biological processes that are somewhat time-linked and, rep and are, uh, they, they display some of these uh, rhythmic patterns um, related to one's circadian rhythms. So the human body, uh, in order to actually control some of these processes, the human body has central and peripheral circadian clocks. And clocks is kind of a metaphor, but that's what they're called when you talk about them. Um, you know, I, I've taken lectures uh, in various physiology courses. We do call them circadian clocks, uh, and they essentially coordinate circadian rhythms and, and, of, and by extension, the related biological processes that are linked to circadian rhythms. Um, and so these clocks, uh, the term that we often use in the field is they are entrained. Uh, basically, the clocks are responding to stimuli that help them understand approximately what metaphorical time it is. You know, they don't really care the number, you know, is it 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., but, but these circadian clocks need to be essentially tuned and calibrated based on key stimuli. Now, there is a term for these stimuli, and we call them uh, Zeitgebers, uh, which is a German term. Uh, but that it roughly translates to the term time givers. So there are all these different Zeitgebers that are helping our central and peripheral uh, circadian clocks get an idea of, you know, approximately when things should be moving along based on circadian rhythm. So the, these clocks are getting continuously entrained f using uh, these different stimuli to coordinate these responses that are supposed to be changing within these uh, pre-specified patterns. Um, now, when it comes to Zeitgebers, without question, light is the most important Zeitgeber. Uh, it is the most important stimulus that entrains and calibrates and tunes our circadian clocks. And so what that means is, if your light-dark cycle is miscalibrated, it can really severely impact physiological processes like sleep. So getting back to shift workers, shift work often involves irregular sleep patterns uh, or sometimes an uncoupling where the sleep-wake cycle is uncoupled from our natural light-dark cycle. So what that means is when we talk about irregular sleep patterns, like I said, there are some folks who in their occupation, they oscillate back and forth. Sometimes they work the day shift, sometimes they work the night shift, and they're kind of constantly bouncing back and forth. Or they might do one for a few weeks and the other for a few weeks. But I have heard of scenarios where even within the same exact week, you have somebody doing two day shifts and a night shift, uh, which, which of course is a very, very irregular sleep pattern. Uh, and then I also mentioned there's the possibility that even if you don't have an irregular pattern, there could be this uncoupling or decoupling of the sleep-wake cycle from the light-dark cycle. So Normally, uh, under typical circumstances, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, human beings, we like to be awake during the day when it's bright out, and we like to sleep at night when it's dark out. If you always work the night shift, you have this inversion, where all of a sudden when it's dark out, that's when you're awake. When it's light out, that's when you're sleeping. So what we often see is for people who do shift work, uh, these individuals often experience some degree of circadian rhythm disruption or circadian rhythm misalignment that can cause sleep disruption uh, because obviously this, uh, you know, because of this shift in the light-dark cycle, 
uncoupling from the sleep-wake cycle, one of the most, well, probably the most important uh, Zeitgeber is now leading to this kind of miscalibration uh, of, of a number of biological processes, including sleepiness and wakefulness. So this misalignment or disruption of circadian rhythms can lead to sleep disruption. And when we look at the shift work research, there seems to be a very clear, uh, a very clear line between this sleep disruption and a number of cardiometabolic perturbations. And so as a result of those fluctuations, changes, perturbations, what we see is that shift work is often associated with a number of cardiometabolic risk factors and chronic disease states. So in many cases, we'll see elevated risk for certain chronic diseases and elevated risk of things like overweight and obesity, for example. Now, I want to be clear. This does not mean that shift workers cannot be healthy. This just means that the shift work probably isn't doing them any favors as they pursue optimal health for themselves. Now, people who do shift work can probably overcome uh, a great deal of the risk elevation that's associated with doing this shift work. And the way they would overcome that is by doing their best to support their cardiometabolic health. So, of course, there's the obvious stuff, um, you know, exercise, nutrition, we know the drill. Uh, another thing that they can do is try to focus, uh, really give a lot of focus to enhancing sleep quality to the best of their ability. I'm going to get into the details uh, later in this episode about how you would actually do that, how you could strategically try to enhance your sleep quality. Another thing they can try to do is uh, modify or manipulate their light and dark exposure. Now, normally we don't have to do much about this. You know, if you are awake during the day and you sleep at night, uh, usually you don't have to go too far out of your way to uh, artificially create a, a really suitable light-dark cycle. Now, if you're doing shift work, you might have to actually fabricate or, or kind of synthetically create a situation where you have appropriate light exposure at the right time and appropriate lack of light exposure at the right time. And so what that would look like is making sure that your sleeping environment is very, very dark. Uh, and one of the things I like to do is I actually wear an eye mask to sleep, and I also wear earplugs to sleep, um, which is great because once I get used to that, I know that wherever I'm sleeping, even if I'm traveling and I don't know, you know uh, what the room is going to be like when I get there, I can always ensure that I'm going to be sleeping in a quiet, comfortable, dark environment because I bring the quiet and the dark with me. Um, so, so that's something that's been very helpful to me. But you want to make sure you're sleeping in a dark environment. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not exposing your eyeballs to a bunch of really bright light in the hours immediately preceding bed. Um, and, and so usually what that means is a shift worker. They might be working uh, in an environment where there's a bunch of really bright lights. Um, you know, when they get home from that shift, they might want to really focus on having at least an hour or two where they're, you know, in dim lighting and preferably avoiding bright lights and lights that are uh, of a, you know, with blue wavelengths. Uh, the other thing they'll want to do is, aside from avoiding uh, bright lights at night, they also might want to find a strategy to get some bright light exposure in the morning, shortly after waking. Now, this is more possible than ever because there are now a number of products that try to essentially replicate sunlight. Um, and, and so you can kind of do a, a version of kind of at-home light therapy where uh, shortly upon waking, you try to expose yourself to some of these bright lights. Uh, of course, you never want to look directly into a super bright light. Uh, but, but I know that there are a number of products out there that try to uh, replicate the experience of sunlight exposure. Um, and these have, these have become more popular and they come in handy when you live somewhere with a really high latitude in the winter time. Days get very, very, very short. Um, you know, I, I've had some, some clients who live in, uh, you know, Sweden, uh, Finland, you know, some of these areas in the, uh, the Northern hemisphere, very high latitude during the winter time. It's really hard to get uh, sunlight exposure in the morning because the sun just isn't going to be up for a while. So there are a number of products on the market now where you can try to uh, basically artificially replicate a light-dark cycle that is more compatible with, uh, you know, your sleep-wake cycle. Uh, so you're kind of trying to 
manipulate the, the this important Zeitgeber of light so that you can uh, alter your light-dark cycle to match your sleep-wake cycle. Um, now, I, I will admit, some of those products, I'm sure, are very, very expensive. The, these, these different light sources that try to replicate sunlight, I will admit and acknowledge I have not priced them out. I don't know what the going rate is. I would imagine there's a pretty big spread in terms of pricing. Uh, I haven't looked into it. Uh, so if these are just impossibly expensive and therefore this advice isn't very good, I apologize in advance. Um, but it is an option that I know exists. Uh, so what should you do if you work in an occupation where shift work is common? Uh, this is something that I have navigated previously. Uh, there are many people close to me in my life, people who are very important to me who do shift work. And, and sometimes I'll when they're changing jobs or applying to jobs, I might, you know, drop a little bit of, you know, I might give them my two cents about what would be um, a suitable way to go. So I think if you can swing it, day shift would be ideal. But of course, that's not always going to be an option. You know, people really like to work the day shift, so that, that can be hard to come by. Uh, if you can't work the day shift, I actually personally would prefer to work night shift only. So rather than going back and forth, I'd say, okay, if I can't do all day shift, I'd rather do all night shift. Uh, and, and that way I can do some of these strategies to try to sync up my, my light dark cycle with my sleep wake cycle. To me, the worst of both worlds would be oscillating back and forth between day shifts and night shifts. To me, that would not be an, an, not be an ideal scenario. And if possible, I would try to avoid it. But of course, I understand it's not always possible. We got to do what we got to do to make a living. Sometimes it's going to be unavoidable. But no matter the scenario, you know, you want to just be mindful of those behaviors so that you can modify uh, those behaviors and ultimately try to reduce um, any chronic disease risk or cardiometabolic outcomes that have been associated with shift work in the past. And like I said, there are modifiable things we can do to attenuate uh, some of those risk factor elevations. So we want to focus strategically on light dark exposure. We want to focus on sleep quality and we want to focus on just good old exercise and nutrition. So now I want to talk, I want to kind of shift the conversation and talk more about sleep as it pertains to more fitness oriented outcomes. One of the things that a lot of people have noticed, if you're listening, you've probably noticed this as well. If you've been in the exercise game for a while, uh, when we are getting poor sleep, either we're getting insufficient amounts of sleep or insufficient sleep quality, a lot of times we will find that training quality goes down significantly. So it's very, very common to see a major impairment of training quality when you are either not sleeping enough or not sleeping well enough. So I'm going to link a couple papers. One is by Kirchen and colleagues, the other by Craven and colleagues. They talk a little bit about uh, how our training quality specifically is likely to be impaired or impeded by insufficient sleep. Uh, the specific impairments that we tend to see in this literature overall, we see impairments in endurance capacity, work capacity, we see an increased level of perceived exertion per unit of work. So what that means is you do the same workout, but it just feels way, way harder. Or you try to do the same workout, but it feels so much harder that you're unable to do it effectively. Uh, execution of highly skilled tasks. So what, what I mean there is if you are really, really underslept, uh, is it going to impair your ability to do a leg extension or a bicep curl? Maybe if, if it's, you know, exertion is really high, you're trying to do a bunch of work capacity or, or, you know, more of a muscular endurance task, you could see some of those big impacts on a very simple movement like a bicep curl or a leg extension. But when we talk about a snatch, a clean and jerk, a squat, a deadlift, as we get into some of these more skilled movements, we start to see even bigger impairments in terms of performance uh, in the gym and our overall training quality. So it's, it's not that the unskilled movements or the lower skilled movements are unimpacted at all. You know, it's not like there's absolutely no impact, but the impact is much bigger when we're looking at some of these more um, skill dependent movements. And then finally, another specific impairment that we see in the literature is just recovery. It, it, it seems when we're chronically underslept, 
it seems to be a little bit more difficult to recover from our training, uh, from our training uh, sessions, our workouts. Uh, so, just to reiterate here, you know, if you are doing a program that involves uh, a ton of really uh, low repetition sets with very very low skill movements, and the overall volume of your program is low, so if for some reason you know, you're going in and you're doing a lot of triples on the leg extension and you're not accumulating a lot of volume, that workout might not get impacted all that much by sleep restriction. Of course, if you get into very, very extreme sleep restriction, then you're going to start to see bigger changes. Um, you know, but, but when we talk about most common training programs with the type of work capacity that they demand, the type of movements that they demand, most folks listening to this are going to notice a pretty meaningful drop in training quality if they're getting insufficient sleep. Most practically applicable training programs are going to be hit uh, relatively hard by by severe sleep impairment. Uh, the degree to which your program or your training uh, your training quality is impacted is going to come down to the specific elements of the training program. Like I said, endurance, work capacity, perceived exertion, skillful execution, and recovery. Uh, another area for fitness enthusiasts where, where we see some pretty major downsides from insufficient sleep is when we look at appetite. Now, we did a, a, a episode recently that was all about hunger and appetite management. One thing that I didn't get into because I knew I was going to save it for this episode is that insufficient sleep can have a pretty big impact on appetite and hunger. And specifically, it can lead us in a direction that predisposes uh, overconsumption. So it usually pushes us in the direction of overeating because of an elevation in appetite. And there's a paper, uh, I'm going to link it in the show notes. It's called Sleep Debt and Obesity by Bayon and colleagues. And they had a couple really nice, um, you know, they had some nice tables and figures in their paper. One figure in particular, figure one, it's a really nice overview. I love a good figure, by the way. When I'm going through scientific papers, figures are truly terrific. Um, great way to convey a lot of information very simply. Uh, but figure one of this paper talks about how sleep debt, so basically this chronic accumulation of many nights of poor sleep over time, how sleep debt can ultimately predispose weight gain and the development of obesity. Uh, looking at the behavioral side, there might be reductions in total daily energy expenditure, less physical activity, uh, more time to eat because we're just awake more. Uh, but that we also see specifically when it comes to appetite, increases in snacking, increases in alcohol consumption, and just a general tendency toward poor diet quality. We see that people tend to eat more. They tend to have cravings for, for foods that we would generally categorize as a pretty low quality diet. We tend to see that people are snacking more and ultimately that they are consuming a lot more energy than they had intended. Now, figure one in that paper also looks at a bunch of other biological pathways that are impacted by, uh, by sleep debt, a bunch of you know biological pathways that can ultimately uh, predispose weight gain and obesity as well. I'm going to save those for another day, but ultimately, in a nutshell, what we're talking about there with those biological pathways it's a whole bunch of stuff that generally increases hunger and increases appetite. And another thing I will mention that's not in this figure is the fact that there's uh, an interesting kind of triad, a bit of a three-way relationship uh, between poor sleep uh, in terms of quality and quantity, uh, stress, psychogenic stress, and food intake. And a lot of times what we'll see is, is that uh, when, for example, I'm going to treat uh, sleep as the causative uh, factor here, but, but there is kind of a bi-directional thing going on. But when people are underslept and you know, they're sleeping poorly, they're not sleeping enough, they're accumulating a sleep debt, a lot of times we'll see that they become a little bit more susceptible to stress, just day-to-day -day psychogenic stress. And sometimes that stress itself can also lead to, to overeating because stress eating is a thing. A lot of times when we're stressed out, we do tend to overeat. We tend to have a uh, poorer appetite regulation. Uh, and a lot of times we do have increased craving uh, for foods that, like I said, probably aren't, aren't the highest quality foods in terms of their nutritional value. So there's this kind of three-way relationship between sleep debt, 
stress, and food consumption that ultimately nudges us in the direction of overconsumption. Uh, number four, or is this number four or number three? I can't tell. But another thing <laughs> to consider when we're talking about um, you know fitness-related issues that arise from insufficient sleep it's just less favorable changes in body composition. You know, broadly speaking, I'm going to link a couple of studies in the show notes here. There are studies where, you know, we see people doing these interventions that are supposed to be enhancing body composition. Generally speaking, the goal in these studies is to uh, gain or at least maintain as much fat-free mass as you can while simultaneously losing as much fat mass as you can. A lot of times we see unfavorable differences in both directions. So people will experience less favorable changes in fat-free mass and less uh, or smaller reductions in fat mass when we compare a group who's getting plenty of sleep to a group who has impaired sleep. So broadly speaking, we will see in some of these studies that are looking at the impact of sleep quantity and quality on body composition we'll see less favorable changes on both sides of the coin, both when it comes to muscle mass or fat-free mass and the ability to lose fat mass. So that's not ideal. And ultimately, that's going to be related to a lot of the stuff that we've already covered. So we talked about impaired training quality. Of course, that's not going to be great for, for inducing really favorable changes in body composition. You know, training is, I would say, the most important lever that we can pull in terms of, uh, eh, I don't want to get into that whole thing about what percentage is training, what percentage is diet, but training's important if you want to increase if you want to improve body composition, especially if you want to build muscle. Training is the most important lever that we can pull there. So if you have impaired uh, training quality, that's not going to be great for improving body composition. If you have impaired recovery, then that is going to tie into impaired training quality over time. Again, not going to be great. And as we've already covered, there seems to be a great deal of appetite dysregulation and also just dysregulation of, more broadly speaking, desire to eat. There seems to be more food craving, uh, more tendency to opt for less health compatible food options. So we see a number of reasons that an individual would have greater challenges building muscle and greater challenges losing fat if they're chronically underslept. Uh, there are also some very direct mechanisms by which lack of sleep could impair hypertrophy. That's an area where I wish we had more research on the relationship between sleep and hypertrophy. Um, there is some very applied research saying that, you know what, if you're not sleeping enough, it makes it pretty tough to lose a lot of weight, lose a lot of fat mass. Um, there's not as much uh, research where we have two groups of folks doing a longitudinal training intervention we're looking at hypertrophy. One group uh, it, you know, it is on a restricted sleep protocol and the other is doing plenty of sleep uh, or is getting plenty of sleep. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of that research and it's understandable why we don't have that research. It's very, very difficult to get someone to sign up for a study and say, guess what? Uh, you're going to sleep like crap for the next 12 weeks because that's how long it's going to take to get a really good look at hypertrophy here with resistance training. You know, it's it's not easy, but it's easy enough to get people in the lab and say, hey, you're going to have one or two or three crappy nights of sleep. We'll make sure it's not happening during midterms or finals. You'll be all right. Uh, but when it comes to multiple week protocols, that, that's a very, very challenging thing to do. It's a big burden to put on a research participant. And as someone who has been in the trenches doing a whole bunch of human subjects research, um, you know, you really have to think about the burden you're placing on participants when you're designing any kind of intervention type trial. Uh, you know, it, it's absolutely critical uh, for, for that trial to be worth doing. You have to make sure that it's going to be feasible for per participants to do it um, and to uh, not perceive it as an insurmountable or just completely, um, you know, just a, a completely excessive burden that's going to make their life a, a living hell for the next two or three months. So um, I understand why we don't have a lot of that research, but there is some some more mechanistic research that gives us clues to indicate that impairments in sleep probably will uh, lead to to some extent to impairments in hypertrophy. So we there. I'm going to link a couple studies in the show notes here, but there is some research indicating that. When we're underslept, we have a skewed balance of anabolic and catabolic hormones 
that generally nudges us in, in the direction of increased catabolic hormones and, and reduced anabolic hormones. Now, I don't like to overstate the importance of some of these short-term hormonal fluctuations when it comes to hypertrophy and body composition, but I think uh, if you are having poor enough sleep for a long enough time and really accumulating a serious sleep debt, uh, I, I think it's very plausible to suggest that these hormonal factors could become relevant over time. Uh, and then there's also some research pointing to impaired muscle protein synthesis uh, when an individual is underslept uh, and has very, very poor sleep quality or quantity. Now, muscle protein synthesis is not necessarily the exact same thing as hypertrophy. That's something we've talked about on the podcast before. It's something that I've talked about, uh, I've written about in the mass research review a few times. Uh, the two outcomes are not perfectly correlated, but in a short-term study, muscle protein synthesis is often the best we can do when we're trying to make inferences about uh, what would happen if we were able to do this for 12 weeks and actually study hypertrophy. Uh, so those are some of the issues we can run into, both in terms of general health and wellness but also related to more fitness-related outcomes. And so at this point, I want to shift the conversation and talk a little bit more about strategies to minimize the impact of poor sleep. Um, so if you're someone who's been sleeping very poorly, uh, what do we do about that so that we can uh, right the ship and get to a spot where we are uh, effectively supporting health, wellness, and fitness-related goals? I'm going to talk about strategies that kind of fit on three different tiers, in my opinion. We've got the least favorable strategies, the slightly more favorable strategies, and then the most favorable strategies. Um, so least favorable is going to be caffeine, napping, and caffeinated napping. Slightly more favorable would be just kind of acutely, when you're underslept, making some small modifications to your training program so that you're not going to have quite as notable an impairment of training quality. Uh, but the most favorable, in my opinion, is to focus on sleep hygiene principles in order to improve your sleep quantity and quality. So the most favorable thing is to directly fix the problem. But we are going to talk about all three of these categories. So starting out, uh, caffeine. Like I said, not what I would call a super favorable um, strategy here, uh, but it does work, right? So there's no surprises here. If you consume caffeine when you're underslept, um, it will offset some of the sleepiness that you're experiencing. It will increase wakefulness. Um, and there's a, a, a position stand or a position statement by the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. The lead author was uh, Dr. Guest. So Guest and colleagues wrote this paper. I was uh, very, very fortunate to be able to contribute to that paper. And there's a quote from that paper. Um, just to kind of give you, uh, get right to the conclusion here, caffeine may improve cognitive and physical performance in some individuals under conditions of sleep deprivation. So caffeine, there, there's quite a few studies indicating that it offsets some elements of sleep deprivation or impaired sleep quality or quantity. However, this is a short-term solution, kind of a band-aid solution. You're not actually fixing the problem you're trying to just kind of circumvent it with a short-term strategy. Because here's the problem. If you rely too heavily on caffeine, a lot of times you will pay a price afterward. Uh, that, that might be an exaggeration, a, a bit too serious of language to say you're going to pay the price. Uh, but there are some downsides. And uh, you know the, the, the downsides ultimately, in my opinion, uh, in some cases can outweigh the upside. So yes, you get this, um, this short-term solution that allows you to offset uh, some of the downsides of sleep deprivation. Uh, but caffeine has a pretty long half-life. Uh, you know, for a lot of folks, it's going to be five to eight hours. Um, I, I, I co-authored a textbook chapter a while back about caffeine. One of the things that I find amazing about caffeine is if you look into the literature for half-life estimates, the original papers documenting uh, half-life estimates of caffeine the variability is immense. I mean, I, I've seen, I believe, I'm going off memory here, I believe I've seen some estimates where the half-life in a particular paper, they estimate it's about two or three hours. I've seen others where it's up in the 10 to 12 hour range. Um, and, and so the half-life, we're talking about just eliminating half of the concentration from the blood. Um, and we talk about the time it takes to do that. 
Uh, but, but the reason we care about a half-life, we use this as a metric for how long is this going to be in my system uh, doing its thing. And so the problem with a long half-life, like I said, it's usually people will say five to six hours, five to eight hours. It depends a lot. It varies from person to person, but that's about the time frame we're talking about. When we have a half-life that long, it means if you have caffeine late in the day, uh, it's still going to be in your system when it's time to lay down and go to sleep. And it could actually impair your ability to fall asleep or the quality of sleep that you get that night. And so what we see is this uh, fairly vicious cycle where you have been getting crappy sleep, so you lean on caffeine, but then the caffeine, because you're leaning on it so much, particularly late in the day, it's causing you to have crappy sleep. And so then the crappy sleep leads to the caffeine, the caffeine leads to the crappy sleep, and we're really not getting anywhere. You know, we just have a lot of short-term solutions and we're paying the price on the back end. Uh, so when I say late in the day, a lot of times people will ask, you know, well, okay, so how long do I have to wait or how long of a, of a gap do I need between my last caffeine dose and the time I go to bed? Ultimately, I don't think I have a good answer to that. And it's not, it's not for lack of trying. Uh, like I said, when I was uh, writing that textbook chapter several years back, uh, I was digging into the, the literature pretty hard. And I can tell you based on a study that I'm going to link in the show notes, um, it's probably at least six hours for most people. Uh, the clearance time, the half-life of caffeine, it's going to vary from person to person. Uh, I would expect that the dose that you're getting uh, for your last caffeine dose before bed probably matters. Um, so you can probably have a small caffeine dose closer to bed rather than a really large caffeine dose uh, within the same time frame. I don't know if I can give a great answer, but I can say based on the evidence, it's probably at least six hours. But what I would encourage people to do is uh, try to help yourself out. You know, so if you think it might be six hours, see if you can do eight, see if you can do 10, see if you can even do 12. What, what I encourage people to do is pay attention to when, you know, the days where you wake up feeling like you got really poor sleep versus the days where you wake up feeling really, really refreshed and really uh, you know, if you feel like you just got really great sleep, pay attention to your caffeine timing. For some folks, you might be able to get away with having caffeine four hours before bed. Others, it might be six. Others, it might be eight or 10 or 12. And I would encourage people to experiment with that because that's a pretty important variable that is pretty easy to manipulate and strategically adjust. So I would encourage people to guess and check. And if you're not sure, I mean, Ultimately, it's a matter of priority, but I err on a longer gap between my caffeine intake and the time I go to bed. Lately, in the past several years, I've really been trying to push a lot more of my caffeine intake earlier in the day. And I've actually been reducing my caffeine intake quite a lot. I used to, to drink a, a really absurd amount of caffeine on a daily basis. I've cut that down. I've shifted it earlier in the day. I try to keep it all in the morning before uh, before noon. Uh, and, and that's been pretty helpful for me. So might be a little bit of guess and check that you have to do, but um, ultimately you want to make sure that you're not uh, having a bunch of caffeine right before bed. Uh, one thing I will note, the, the last thing I'll mention on this topic is some people uh, make what I consider to be an erroneous conclusion. And they'll say, oh, I had caffeine two hours before bed and I fell asleep just fine. Falling asleep is not the same thing as having a really great high quality night of sleep. There are some folks who will fall asleep well and say, well, clearly the caffeine didn't have an effect, but if you sleep like crap or you're tossing and turning or you just wake up and you don't feel like you're very rested and refreshed, it's possible that you've impacted sleep quality without impacting sleep quantity. Uh, another thing, you know, just in analogous situations, sometimes people will have alcohol before bed which can disrupt sleep quality. And some people will have alcohol before bed and say, oh, I slept great, no big deal, it didn't have an impact. Well, the effect of alcohol in the nighttime hours, the effect that it has on sleep is pretty complicated. Well, it's not that complicated, it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but it, it's a little bit more nuanced than just good or bad. Because you know, alcohol acutely has a bit of a sedative effect uh, where, where you know, we drink a little bit of alcohol, you know, sometimes people say, I like to have a glass of wine. It helps me get to sleep at night or something like that. 
So there is acutely um, an effect where we get a little bit sleepy. Sometimes it helps us doze off a little bit. But what we often find in the literature is when people have too much alcohol before bed, they get to sleep just fine. But a few hours into that night of sleep, sleep quality really starts to take a hit. They might be tossing and turning. They might be waking up several times throughout the night. Usually it's the sleep quality, specifically during the second half of that night of sleep, that seems to be impacted more. Uh, moving on to napping. Once again, no surprises here. Uh, I think people intuitively have known since they were essentially a baby, if I'm sleepy and grumpy, a little nap can help, and I feel a little bit more refreshed after that nap. Um, there was a paper by Hisuna and colleagues that uh, my dear friend Dr. Eric Helms reviewed in the Mass Research Review. Um, they're finding, just to put it in a nutshell from this study, they were looking at the effects of napping on, on a number of performance-related outcomes, and they found that a nap opportunity has a beneficial effect on physical performance and attention with better results observed for naps greater than or equal to 35 minutes in duration. So much like caffeine, taking a little nap, you know, 30, 45 minutes, give or take, uh, maybe even an hour, is likely to offset some elements of sleep deprivation. But just like caffeine, this is what I would call kind of a short-term Band-Aid solution. The reason I say that, if we lean too heavily on naps, once again, we can pay a bit of a price afterward. It kind of catches up to us on the back end. Uh, if we nap for too long or we nap too late in the day, uh, that can make it hard to get high quality sleep the subsequent night. So now napping has caused a bit of sleep disruption. And here we are again in that vicious cycle where the nap causes sleep disruption. The sleep disruption makes it such that we need a nap, which causes sleep disruption. And there we go again, back and forth. Now, what about both? Why choose one when you can do both? We, we've got the idea of caffeinated napping. And there was a study fairly recently by Ramdani and colleagues, which I'll link in the show notes. I actually did a research spotlight about that uh, for Stronger by Science. So if you are a member of the email newsletter, if you get that every Wednesday, uh, this study might ring a bell. And I believe I covered this in the Mass Research Review as well. Uh, so what they were looking at here was the idea of a caffeinated nap. And what that means is you're consuming caffeine right before the onset of a nap. And you might be thinking, well, how is that even going to work, right? If you're having caffeine, it's going to make it hard to take a nap. Well, the reason this is a viable strategy is because when we consume caffeine, I mean, it's going to start getting into your bloodstream quickly if, if we're talking about just detecting any at all. But usually it's going to take a good 30 to 45 minutes for caffeine to have its peak effect in terms of maximizing levels in circulation and maximize, or, you know, beginning to enhance uh, you know, wakefulness, alertness, etc. So it usually takes 30 or 45 minutes for that caffeine to really kick in. Uh, which is pretty convenient because that means if you have this caffeine right before you begin the nap, the caffeine is really going to start to hit as your nap is winding down. So you can lay down for a nice 30, 45 minute nap, maybe an hour. When you wake up, that caffeine is starting to, to kind of really kick in. And, and that puts you in a spot where you can kind of leverage both of these strategies um, simultaneously. Uh, and there is some research supporting um, the effectiveness of this particular approach for exercise applications. Um, so, so it is a viable strategy, but uh, you know, if we talk about combining two kind of short-term Band-Aid strategies, uh, we just have two different Band-Aids here. So it, it still would fall under the umbrella of what I would call some of the least favorable approaches. Doesn't mean it doesn't work but it really is a short-term strategy that's not addressing the actual problem. So if it's going to be a one-time thing, sure, caffeine, nap, caffeinated nap, no big deal. You know, it's going to help you get through that training session. Uh, but if we're talking about a daily thing, might not be ideal. As the first and only fitness podcast with a steadfast commitment to traditional family values, we know that protecting families is important. Right you are, Eric. But I will note, there are some things that are even more important than protecting traditional family values and the moral fabric of our society. That's right, Greg. 
It's important to protect families, but it's even more important to protect corporate entities. That's why I joined the advisory board for the Sports Nutrition Association, along with trusted fitness pros like Danny Lennon and distrusted arch nemeses like Eric Helms. The Sports Nutrition Association is the home of sports nutrition. They are dedicated to ensuring the sustainable prosperity of the sports nutrition profession, and they offer a unique pathway to robust insurance coverage for your sports nutrition business. Simply put, it's the best way to protect the corporate entities that are closest to your heart. And I should note, if you're an individual sole proprietor uh, providing sports nutrition services and not a corporate entity, the Sports Nutrition Association can help you out as well. That is correct. All insurance plans are handled individually on a case-by-case basis, regardless of how your sports nutrition business is structured. But even if you don't want insurance coverage, SNA membership comes with a bunch of other perks and advantages. The Sports Nutrition Association is the only global professional sports body that has a defined standard for sports nutrition scope of practice for its members. This ensures that members maintain high standards in their practice so that the public can always trust in the quality associated with the services of an accredited sports nutritionist through the Sports Nutrition Association. If you already meet their minimum education requirements, you can become an accredited sports nutritionist today. Uh, If you don't meet those education requirements yet, you can enroll in the certificate program in Applied Sports Nutrition. That allows you to become a provisionally accredited member upon completion. To learn more about the Sports Nutrition Association, head over to www.sportsnutritionassociation.com today. Today's episode is sponsored by the Sports Nutrition Association and Stronger by Science LLC sincerely appreciates their support. Uh, Now, a slightly more favorable strategy uh, than, you know, napping or caffeine, like I mentioned, is to make some strategic modifications to your training program. Uh, So we can do this strategically because, like I mentioned previously, if we look at the literature on how sleep deprivation impacts exercise or training quality, we can look at the specific elements of training quality that seem to be most negatively impacted. Um, And so what we're trying to do here, uh, if we're going to modify our training program, is we want to make our training program different so that it relies less on the elements of training that are most severely impacted by impaired sleep. Uh, So what we want to do, you know, if you're focusing on strength, if strength is your main outcome, that you're, that you're training for, you might want to opt for simpler movements, you know, so maybe a leg press instead of a squat. Um, and you want to aim for low volume with low rep ranges. And so what that'll do, if you're a strength focused lifter and you're focusing on simple movements with low volume and low repetition ranges, that should attenuate some of those negative impacts that sleep impairment has on endurance, work capacity, and the execution of skillful movements or physical tasks. So that would be how I adjust the program if I'm training for strength. Now, if I'm training mostly for hypertrophy, what I want to do there is opt for strategies that allow me to accumulate plenty of volume in my training session with a reduced perception of effort. Because like I said, uh, if you're in a very volume-heavy, hypertrophy-focused training block, you might notice that sleep deprivation, because it increases perceived exertion during a a training bout, you might find that it's really hard to complete your normal amount of training volume without making some modifications. So one of the things I like to do, um, and and Dr. Mike Zordos wrote about this recently in the Mass Research Review, one of the strategies I like to do, I didn't actually know there was a name for it. This is just something I had done uh, pretty frequently. Uh, and that, then he um, reviewed this study and I said, oh, cool, there's a name. But the name is rest redistribution sets. And to give an example, let's say I was going to do a normal, uh, you know, a normal approach to training and I'm going to do three sets of six repetitions with maybe three minutes of rest in between those sets. Three sets of six, plenty of rest between those sets, pretty normal setup there. Instead of that, what you would do... <coughs> with a rest redistribution strategy is you would do nine sets of two 
with only 45 seconds of rest between those sets. Now, I don't follow that type of protocol religiously, uh, but the general idea is that instead of having these really discrete sets that are kind of blocked off where we do a, a really uh, challenging bout here, you know, a really good effort, and then pause for an extended period of time, two or three minutes, and then we do another discrete set of effort, what we're doing is just kind of spreading this effort out. We do a couple reps, wait a little bit, do a couple more, wait a little bit, do a couple more. And so the, the reason that I kind of eased my way into this strategy without knowing it existed is because back in the day, I did a little bit of blood flow restricted training when I was injured. And the most common protocol that you see in the literature for blood flow restricted training is 30, 15, 15, 15. So basically what you do, uh, uh, and, and like I said, I, I prefer to use this when I'm um, like injured or training around something, but you, let's say you're doing leg extensions, you, you know, get, get all wrapped up for your blood flow restriction. You do a set of 30 and take a relatively brief pause between, between sets and then do 15, a brief pause, 15, brief pause, 15. And the, the brief pause in there, you get the idea that this is kind of just one big prolonged set in a way, and you're just kind of spreading it out. You start out with a pretty tough, uh, you know, set of 30, and then you're just kind of doing, you know, almost like back off sets, but it's all one big kind of prolonged set because you're keeping the wrap tight uh, and, and you're not taking long rest periods. So basically I had, um, without thinking too much about it, I don't like to go into like the, you know, the, the bodybuilding websites and say, I need a name for whatever I'm doing. I like to focus more on training principles. I feel like if you've studied exercise at the university level for 10 years, you should be able to figure it out <laughs> without, without somebody telling you you're allowed to do this because it has a name. So I, I really try to focus on the principles um, uh, that, that I've learned uh, of just learning physiology for a long time. And so for me, what I found was when I would walk into the gym and just feel like crap, you know, maybe I'm underslept, maybe I'm really mentally fatigued. Um, you know, in my line of work, mental fatigue sneaks up on me, you know, start riding, you get caught up in it, you want to go to the gym and you're just like, man, my brain is fried. So if I'm really mentally fatigued or I'm really underslept, uh, you know, if I've got a lot of sleep debt that has built up, I might get on a chest press machine, you know, low skill movement. And I'm just trying to focus on hypertrophy Actually, I really like the the free motion cable chest machine where I do a lot of chest flies. I'm, I've been loving that one lately. Um, I might get on there, put in a really manageable load, um, you know, with the little um, selectorizer thing there. So put the pin in there, nice easy load, maybe do a set of 10 or 15, take a little bit of a, of a break, not very long. And then just do a number of smaller sets. So usually, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to push that first set, you know, really, really close to failure. Just want to feel a good effort, you know, leave a handful of reps in reserve. But, you know, I might start out with a higher rep effort. And then I just kind of back off and take a little break, do a set of six or seven, take a little break, do a set of five or six, take a little break, do a set of, you know, four or five. You know, so over the course of it, I'm not fully recovering between these little breaks. Um, I'm just kind of doing this giant set and I'm accumulating this volume. And I notice that because I'm not, you know, taking a long rest for full recovery, my repetition range starts to kind of trail off um, as I do each of these little clusters of repetition. So that is, you know, if I was doing a hypertrophy focused training program and I was really focused on attenuating uh, the, the impact of the sleep debt I had been building up, that's a strategy that I've personally been really fond of. Um, and only recently did I find out, oh, there's, there's kind of a name for that, which is nice. Um, now that's an okay strategy, but you know, you're not going to pay for it on the back end. It's not like you're going to say, well, I, I did this rest redistribution approach and therefore I'm going to sleep like crap again tonight. You know, you, you don't have that same immediate payment that you owe for using this strategy. That's why I prefer it, uh, over napping or caffeine is because we can just say, Hey, I feel like crap today. Let's change up the training program a little bit just for today, get a great night, night of sleep and get back on our regularly scheduled programming. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to change it every day uh, because ultimately if you have to modify your training program every single day because you feel like crap, you're not really on that training program anymore. You know, you're, you're not able to adhere to it because of the sleep impairment. So this strategy is okay, but obviously it's not something we want to do every single day because then 
your training program is no longer your training program. But the best case scenario, uh, you know, the the absolute uh, most favorable approach to uh, to trying to minimize the impact of poor sleep is to actually fix the problem. And what we want to do is focus on sleep hygiene principles to maximize the likelihood that we're going to get enough, you know, high enough sleep quality and high enough sleep quantity. So I mentioned way back earlier in this episode, uh, I said, you know, hey, if you're doing shift work, you might want to try to just really focus in on sleep quality. And I said, yeah, I'll get to that later. This is what I'm talking about is using the principles of good sleep hygiene to try to maximize your ability to get really high quality sleep and to get enough sleep every night. Now, there are a lot of different recommendations pertaining to sleep hygiene. You can find a lot of different lists. Uh, A lot of different sleep foundations have their own kind of preferred set. Uh, A lot of different health-related organizations now have, you know, uh, their set of recommendations. One that I'm going to use here is the uh, Norwegian Competence Center for Sleep Disorders. Um, And the reason I'm using this is because I wrote about a study uh, in the mass research review a couple of years back that actually was studying what happens when you try to do this as an intervention. So it's a nice little set of criteria uh, that is drawn from a very fitness related paper where the outcomes were uh, quite positive. So uh, in terms of sleep hygiene tips, number one in this list is keep it dark, quiet, and cool in the room where you sleep. Number two, go to bed and wake up at the same time during the whole week, including the weekends. Having a regular sleep-wake cycle is really, really helpful. Uh, Number three, go to bed so that you can actually get about eight hours of sleep. Uh, So the first step in getting eight hours of sleep is giving yourself an eight-hour opportunity to sleep. Uh, Number four, they're talking about tips to implement two hours before bedtime. First of all, turn down the lights, dim light, avoiding really bright light and blue wavelength light. Uh, The second one, put away uh, screens. So your computer, iPad, mobile phones, um, put those things away or dim them and try to use a blue light filter. Uh, Third one, no exercise. Uh, The reason they say that if you do a bunch of really intense exercise very shortly before bed, It could potentially interfere with sleep quality, but doing a lot of exercise earlier in the day actually helps with sleep quality. So with exercise, the timing and the intensity seem to be important. You don't want to do a bunch of really intense exercise immediately before bed. Uh, The next one, no food, coffee, or black tea uh, or caffeinated drinks. So you don't want to have a really big meal right before bed, and you certainly don't want to be consuming uh, caffeinated beverages. The next one here within these two hours before bed, uh, do some calm and positive activities and don't bring up relational conflicts before bedtime. So the whole idea there is you want to get your mind into a state where being calm and restful is possible. You don't want to do things that are really stressful, really cognitively demanding, really emotionally upsetting. You want to put yourself in a mindset where you're really able to start calming down and easing into a state of of really high quality relaxation. Uh, Five, when you get up in the morning, expose yourself to as much light as possible right away. Number six, last cup of coffee should be six hours before bedtime. Like I said, I would frame that as being at least six hours before bedtime for most individuals. Uh, Number seven here, try to get so much sleep that you don't need an alarm clock to wake up. I know for some people that's going to sound totally implausible, um, and it, there have been times in my life where where I thought that sounded implausible, um, but it is actually a doable thing. Uh, you, you'd be really surprised if you are really intentional about having a regular sleep schedule and you know adhering to some of these hygiene practices, you might find uh, that you are regularly, routinely waking up without the use of an alarm clock. Uh, if you have an important meeting, you might want to set one anyway, uh, but but you definitely can get there in, in many, many cases. Uh, the next one, do not use electronic devices that emit light in bed. Um, and, and I would say, you know, one of the things you commonly see in these lists is the bed is, you know, you it's reserved for a very select number of activities, uh, with one of them being sleep. So 
You don't want to be sitting in bed doing work throughout the day. You don't want to be doing, uh, in my opinion, personally, a lot of effortful reading in bed. You know, when you get into bed, I like to view that as it's time to sleep. Um, so number nine here, the, the last one on the list is learn a relaxation technique uh, and use it to fall asleep at night or if you wake up during the night, you know, do that relaxation technique. Again, uh, you already know my bias here if you listen to the podcast. Uh, there are a lot of meditation and mindfulness exercises that are very, very helpful for falling, falling asleep. Um, actually, when I was uh, a college student and in, uh, in, in undergrad student, I took a yoga course as part of my curriculum. And at the end of the yoga session, the instructor would often have us lay down and just kind of walk us through a really calming mindfulness, uh, kind of a guided meditation almost. And, you know, I was, I was in college, I was having a lot of fun studying, just really busy sleeping like crap, doing, doing what college kids do. And almost every single time I fell asleep during the guided uh, mindfulness exercise. And I will say, I mean, there are some really incredible, you know, back in the day, apps were kind of few and far between, but there are a lot of really great apps and websites that have guided meditations and guided uh, mindfulness exercises that are specifically for relaxing, calming your mind and easing into sleep. Uh, and, and they tend to be very, very effective in my experience. Now, a couple other common ones that are not on this Norwegian list that I, that I think are worth mentioning. As I said earlier, uh, don't drink too much alcohol before bed. Uh, that can definitely be disruptive. Uh, you might fall asleep very well, uh, but in the later portion of the night, you might find that your sleep quality is very disturbed and very disrupted. Uh, the other one is be mindful of the meal that you're consuming before bed. So this list mentioned, you know, try not to have a meal within two hours of bedtime. Um, I'm not necessarily as concerned about the timing. I'm more interested in the composition of, of the meal. Uh, my personal experience and some of the research I've looked at, I'm not convinced that you shouldn't consume anything within two hours of bed. There have been studies with, um, with pre-bed protein intake that seem totally fine uh, in terms of not inducing major impairments in sleep quality or quantity. Uh, but like I said, I'm more interested not in the timing of that meal, but the actual composition. So you don't want that meal to be too large. You don't want it to be too fatty. Uh, and the reason we talk about those two is just because of digestion. If you're consuming that meal in close proximity to bed and it's a really heavy meal, it's really large, there's a lot of calorie content, it's really fatty and, and fat does tend to digest pretty slowly. You might just find a situation where your stomach is just really unsettled as you're trying to sleep. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is uh, research has indicated that you don't want to go to bed uh, immediately after having a very spicy meal. So you don't want the meal to be too large, too fatty, or too spicy. Uh, when it comes to these sleep hygiene tips, uh, the most notable things from my perspective, uh, in my personal experience, and from looking at the literature. And by the way, I do want to mention, I think it's relevant here, my personal experience with sleep hygiene is extensive. Um, I've talked about this before on many a podcast. Um, I don't know if I've talked about it on this one. But uh, back in, I think, 2017, that was when I... Uh, earned my pro card in natural bodybuilding and made my pro debut in natural bodybuilding. And in order to do that, I got very, very lean. Um, you know, I, I was one of those bodybuilders who was never, ever, ever going to be the most muscular on stage. I won by being very, very lean. And what happens uh, a lot of times with bodybuilders who are prepping is as they get really, really lean, as they get closer to showtime, they they often experience some pretty considerable sleep disturbance. And people had asked me, you know, pretty shortly after that competitive season, they said, oh man, that must have been terrible. I bet you were so lethargic. You were so hungry. Um, and I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. But without question, by a mile, the worst part of that prep for me was not hunger, was not food cravings, was not being lethargic, although I was very lethargic. 
the biggest issue for me was the massive drop in sleep quality and sleep quantity. It was very, very difficult for me to be able to get to sleep. Um, and that it, that is what happens sometimes when you have very low energy availability and very, very low body fat. So I had to experiment with everything in the book uh, in terms of trying to give myself an opportunity to sleep well within those circumstances. And what I found based on the literature and my personal experience is when we talk about the most notable elements of sleep hygiene, the highest impact things you can do, um, I think first of all, uh, you know, being mindful of light and dark cycles is huge. And second of all, being really consistent with your sleep cycle. So for me, the most notable things that I did that were very, very helpful, and of course there are many things that go into sleep hygiene, but the big impact stuff was light exposure early in the morning, along with a little bit of physical activity, going out for a walk in the morning when the sun's rising, avoiding light, particularly blue light in the evening, uh, and really being very intentional about going to bed at the same time every day and trying to wake up at the same time every day. And going to bed is easy. That's an act where you just get in the bed and you lay there. Uh, so I, I could do that every night. Waking up, that was a different story. There was a time there, this, this, was, this occurred during when I was uh, working on my PhD, and I know a lot of folks in the department were like, man, this, this Eric Trexler, he is a go-getter. Uh, I was getting to the lab sometimes at two in the morning, three in the morning. Four in the morning would actually be kind of a late start for me when I was in the middle of this contest prep, because I would lay down and try to get to bed at like eight or nine at night. Uh, and I mean, I, I just couldn't sleep for more than, I mean, sometimes it would only be three or four hours and I'd wake up and just be wide awake and I'd say, what, what the hell am I going to do? You know? So I might go to bed at, at 9 PM, uh, wake up at midnight or 1 AM and just be staring at the ceiling in my bedroom and say, well, I am running a study here. I might as well go to the lab and get everything ready to go for our subjects who are coming in at six in the morning. So uh, man, thinking back at it, that was a tough time. That was not a lot of fun. But anyway, those were the things that were most impactful and most helpful as I was wrestling with these major challenges. Um, and it was really funny because, you know, a natural bodybuilder, when they're, when they're getting really, really shredded before a show, um, <laughs> you know, people will say, Hey, you, you really don't look very good right now. You know, your face starts to look really gaunt. Um, but I was so underslept, people would say, Eric, you, you look like absolute garbage. And I'd say, oh, what exactly are you referring to? Are you referring to the fact that I look like a person who doesn't sleep anymore or the fact that I'm wasting away? It was really hard to tell what they were really keying in on when they noticed how terrible I looked. Uh, but that's all in the past and we're good to go now. Um, now, when I talk about light-dark cycles, circadian rhythm, circadian biology, I know that a lot of people in the evidence-based fitness community, uh, they get a little bit cautious. You know, their, their BS detector starts to, uh, to go off a little bit. When you start talking about circadian biology or chrononutrition, anything within that realm, and I understand why. Over the past couple decades, circadian biology, chrononutrition, all these related um, kind of subfields or subtopics, they have been areas where a lot of people who are kind of the biohacker types have really focused on these areas with extremely speculative recommendations. And so it's kind of become uh, a, a, an area where people kind of expect a high level of BS. Uh, but nonetheless, this sleep hygiene stuff, the stuff with light dark cycles, circadian biology, this is legit science. Um, you know, when I was in grad school, I took the, one of the most, uh, it, it was a, a physiology course that there was a reputation. People were scared to death of this course. It was rigorous. It was brutal. It was really in depth. Um, and we covered a lot of circadian biology within that physiology course. This is solid science. And, and I know that some people have in the past tried to twist it a little bit or embellish it or, you know, really speculate with these ultra-specific protocols. 
I understand that people's BS detector goes off when we get into this realm, uh, but that doesn't detract from the from the legitimacy and the robustness of the science. And this is really legit science. Um, now, when when you talk about light dark cycles and sleep cycles, uh, I, I do have to mention that there is uh, a really good source of information for this stuff. Uh, so Andrew Huberman has a podcast called the Huberman Lab, and it's it's funny because I know a lot of folks in evidence based fitness have have sent me clips from from the podcast and said, "How do you feel about this training recommendation?" And I said, "Well, I, I disagree with that. I don't think that's really compatible with the best available evidence." Or you know, people have brought me some clips about training, about nutrition, about caffeine, about supplementation. And there are a great many topics and a great many recommendations that I disagree with when it comes to exercise, nutrition, caffeine, supplements. But I think that Andrew Huberman's uh, work uh, in his podcast when it comes down to light, dark cycles, sleep regulation, circadian biology, I think it's really top-notch stuff. And it makes sense. Um, so to my understanding, uh, he works and does research in the fields of neurobiology and ophthalmology, a kind of the convergence of uh, you know, the neurobiological responses to the eye perceiving stimuli, such as light. Uh, so for that reason, you know, uh, I, I appreciate the work he's doing in terms of doing science communication and getting people excited about science. I don't agree with all of his recommendations pertaining to, you know, the, the stuff I mentioned previously and cold exposure and things like that, but that's okay. You know, you, you can disagree uh, with, with, you know, a handful of someone's perspectives and still say, and still say hey, but I, I appreciate the fact that you're doing science communication. You're getting folks excited about science. You're getting folks excited about physiology specifically. And like I said, I think the work he's doing specifically as it pertains to light dark cycles, circadian biology, and sleep regulation is really, really excellent stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and I can empathize, you know, like as someone who makes content, there are some areas where I say, oh man, we are right in my sweet spot. Uh, and, and there are some, some times where I'm kind of drawn out of my wheelhouse or drawn out of my sweet spot and I cover areas that are, are um, you know, less compatible with the specific research that I've done. And, and, you know, when you start feeling yourself getting out, um, you know, getting out on a limb in some of these less familiar areas, uh, you know, I, I can definitely empathize with, with the idea of trying to cover as many topics as possible, but understanding that some of these topics are not squarely within your wheelhouse and squarely within your very, very specific area of expertise. Uh, you know, when you do a PhD, uh, uh, or, you know, graduate level training, a lot of times the way people put it is that you're trying to learn everything in the world about one little tiny thing. Uh, so, so there's this, uh, you know, really intense focus on a very particular set of topics. Um, so yeah, basically what I'm saying is for more information about sleep, light, dark cycles, circadian biology, I do think Andrew Huberman's, uh, content is very, very good within that realm. Um, but since I work in exercise and nutrition and supplements, I, I have to put the caveat that I, I'd say, well, if you want exercise nutrition stuff, I think the stronger by science folks do a pretty good job with it, but that that's just my two cents. Uh, so I would use each resource accordingly in my opinion. Uh, now some other notable stuff to, to highlight, like I said, avoiding caffeine late in the afternoon and evening when it comes to these really notable sleep hygiene tips. That is one that is very, very high on my list. Uh, a dark and cool sleep environment that is also quiet, very, very critical for supporting good sleep. As I mentioned earlier, letting the mind really relax before bed, finding a way to calm the mind without doing a lot of really cognitively demanding or emotionally demanding stuff before bed. Uh, and here's an extra tip uh, from Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh who is one of my favorite people. Um, I was reading a, a, a very, very short book of his called How to Relax. And it has a really interesting recommendation that has actually been really helpful to me. Uh, you know, sometimes I've been in a situation where I'm sleeping, I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just staring at the ceiling 
and I'm kind of annoyed that I can't get back to sleep. And being annoyed is not really conducive to getting back to sleep. Um, and so it's a really tough situation where you're kind of frustrated and annoyed and agitated that you're not sleeping, but that's not actually helping you get back to sleep. And so in this book, How to Relax by Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, he talks about embracing rest for its own sake, even if you're not falling asleep. So after reading that, I- I've tried it a few times. You know, there have been times where I wake up maybe three or four hours before I intended to wake up. And in the past, I might have been stressed about it, agitated, annoyed, whatever. And I would have tried very hard to get back to sleep, which isn't, you know, it's easier said than done. Now, after reading that recommendation, I've had opportunities where when I wake up in the middle of the night, three or four hours before I intended, I don't stress over being awake. I I just embrace uh, the idea of resting, you know, and, and you can rest without sleeping. And so I tried it out. And I said, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm just going to say, you know what, maybe I won't fall back asleep. Maybe I will sit here and calmly and peacefully enjoy rest in in an awakened state. Uh, Awakened, uh, definitely a a hat tip to the fact that this was uh, a book about Buddhism. But uh, but anyway, I said, I'm just going to enjoy uh, resting for its own sake in the absence of sleep. And what do you know? I I fall asleep very, very quickly when I manage to do that. So I would encourage folks to give that a shot, to consider it. You might find that it it, uh, is a tip that is also helpful for you as it has been for me. Uh, And then another tip here uh, is kind of the opposite. uh, but, But, you know, if you're really, really, really struggling to sleep and you can't even find it, find the ability to rest, you know, you're staring at the ceiling. You've tried to calm your mind and say, hey, let's just enjoy the rest here. And you realize, no, I'm fully awake. Like there's no chance that I'm going to be able to get to sleep. There's no chance that I'm going to be able to calmly enjoy this rest. I am fully awake. And frankly, I got stuff to do. Um, I'm kind of already prepared to begin my day now. If that's the case, just get out of bed. Do something else. Uh, Don't get in the habit of restlessly staring at the ceiling or scrolling through your phone as you lay in bed and just hoping something good's going to happen, I would say if you wake up in the middle of the night, I view it as I've got two options here. One is invest in enjoying this. Dedicate my mind to enjoying rest whether or not I fall back asleep. That's one option. The other option is if I just feel ready to go and I feel well rested and I just want to start my day, get the hell out of bed. Just go do stuff. Um, but, but that middle ground of kind of laying there, staring at the ceiling and being annoyed that you're not sleeping yet, uh, I, I really don't think that's a good strategy. Uh, all right. Uh, and then just one other thing I want to reiterate. Don't do super intense exercise very, very shortly before bed. And once again, try to be mindful of the composition of any food that you're going to be consuming within a couple hours of bedtime. Now, the last topic I want to discuss here is supplements. And I didn't even mention this. Um, when, when I talked about those tiers, I, I talked about, or those categories, I said, you know, these are my least favorable strategies for sleep. These are slightly more favorable. These other ones are most favorable. I didn't include supplements there because I consider supplements to be just kind of a different thing altogether. It, it's kind of on a whole different plane of existence. Now, Sleep hygiene uh, is going to be way more effective than any supplement you're trying to take for sleep, but some supplements are still quite helpful. So that's why I want to treat it as a completely separate thing. Supplements are not going to be a replacement for sleep hygiene. And if you have really, really good sleep hygiene, you might find yourself in a situation where your sleep hygiene is so great that you don't even need these other supplements. They don't even really do much beyond the fact that you have a really excellent sleep wake cycle. Uh, But if you want to go the supplement route, there are some supplements that can be quite helpful in certain scenarios. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are going to be some of my favorite supplements that I might lean on if I'm trying to enhance my sleep quality. And of course, as always, before you try any new supplements, before you mess around with any diet or exercise changes, check with a qualified uh, medical professional just to make sure it's the right thing for you. Um, But a few of my favorites, number one would be low-dose melatonin. Uh, 
I usually don't like to go higher than one milligram. Uh, if you look at the research on melatonin, there's some studies showing efficacy with uh, 0.1 or 0.3 milligrams. Uh, when you look at the store, you, you see these enormous doses where people are selling three, five, even 10 milligram capsules of melatonin. I like to go very low. I like to go no higher than one milligram. The reason I say one milligram is uh, that's usually about as low as I can find at a lot of different stores. So I actually take a melatonin product that's designed for children uh, because I just wanted to look for the lowest dose I could get my hands on at the store. Um, I am a very average uh, suburban American, which means I do some shopping at Costco, which is a big wholesale center. Uh, and I was at Costco and I said, what's the lowest melatonin dose I can get here? Ended up being one milligram. Uh, Costco, not a sponsor of the show, but they should be. If you know someone at Costco, have them reach out. Uh, so low dose melatonin. The reason I like to go low with the dose is there, well, there's two reasons. First of all, that's all you need. Uh, you really don't need these really high doses of melatonin. Uh, if you want to facilitate the onset of sleep, uh, you know, half a mil, uh, half a milligram, one milligram, usually that's plenty. Number two, if you take these really high doses of melatonin, it takes some time for them to actually kind of clear their way out of your system. What we normally want is, you know, like, like I said, these are, there are hormones that experience uh, these kind of circadian linked rhythms. We want them to have ebbs and flows throughout the day. You know, we want melatonin to be increasing as we are about to go to bed. We want melatonin to be high at the onset of sleep, we, but we don't want it to be high in perpetuity. We don't want it to be high three hours after we wake up the next morning. If we take these huge doses of melatonin, sometimes we see an abnormally high melatonin level you know, throughout the early portion of the next day. And so, yeah, we got to sleep, but the next day we feel really sluggish. We don't really feel well rested because we've got this really weird elevation of melatonin that, that would be atypical if we were not supplementing with it. Uh, another one is theanine. And theanine is interesting. Uh, I usually take, you know, 100, 200 milligrams if I'm going to take it. Uh, theanine is interesting because it doesn't necessarily have a direct sedative effect, but it has a very calming effect. And so a lot of folks notice that theanine helps them kind of ease into sleep um, just by, by virtue of helping them kind of reach a, a very calm and restful state. Uh, another one that I like is magnesium glycinate. And what's really cool about magnesium glycinate is that it has magnesium and it has glycine. And both of these have been independently shown in some circumstances to help with sleep in terms of sleep quality and quantity. So the cool thing about magnesium glycinate is it is a nice form of magnesium, but it also is bringing some glycine to the table, which can be favorable for sleep. Uh, the last one I want to mention here is tart cherry extract. And this one is interesting because I don't see much of it on the market when it comes to sleep supplements. Um, for whatever reason, it's been mentioned many times in the literature, especially in the last couple of years, but formulators don't really seem to be coming around and really utilizing it too much in sleep formulas. Not really sure why. I do expect they'll catch on eventually, uh, but there's something in tart cherry extract called procyanidin B2. And what it does is it enhances tryptophan bioavailability. And that's going to, uh, it. if you en enhance the bioavailability of tryptophan, that can facilitate the endogenous production of melatonin and serotonin. So melatonin and serotonin, these are both hormones that we expect to have some ebbs and flows, some ups and downs, peaks and valleys, however you want to put it, uh, that help us regulate our, our, our kind of pattern throughout the night as we're falling asleep, as we're sleeping, and then as we're ultimately waking up. You don't really want to massively disrupt these normal fluctuations in melatonin and serotonin but you do want to make sure that the raw materials are there to facilitate their endogenous production. So I'm not, you know, there is some research that just supplementing with tryptophan can be uh, helpful for sleep-related outcomes, but I actually prefer to have a, a bit of a softer touch, uh, a, a less aggressive approach where instead of just adding a bunch of tryptophan to the situation, I like to uh, lean on tart cherry, cherry extract in the hopes 
that I will simply enhance the bioavailability of the tryptophan that's already present. Uh, little conflict of interest disclosure. I just mentioned uh, my favorite sleep-related supplements. Um, and so, of course, I heard my favorite sleep-related uh, supplement ingredients. I do have to disclose and want to disclose that I helped a company formulate a sleep product with these ingredients. Uh, it's not available yet. When it becomes available, I'll, I'll probably talk about it a little bit more. Uh, so obviously that product reflects my preferred ingredients because I, you know, gave a lot of advice about how that product ought to look. Uh, so it's not that I am retrofitting my favorite uh, ingredients to match that supplement. It's that the supplement looks that way because, you know, this is how I see the literature pertaining to sleep-related supplement ingredients. So uh, there's a company called uh, Joy Mode that uh, makes some supplements uh, pertaining. They, they, they have a couple different supplements uh, and, and one that should be coming in the near future is going to be one that uh, is intended to support high quality sleep. Um, so I, d I just wanted to disclose that conflict of interest so that nobody would, you know, say, hey, wait a minute, it looks like you're just pushing some product, you know, whenever that hits the market. Um, but, but I, like I said, uh, if I was talking to someone and, and they were saying, hey, I'm sleeping like crap, what should I do? I would probably talk about eight or nine different sleep hygiene tips before we even got into the conversation about uh, dietary supplements. But if you were looking at some supplement ingredients, uh, those are the ones that, that I would probably um, consider. And once again, after consulting with a qualified uh, medical professional. All right, so uh, I want to wrap up this episode with a quick summary. Insufficient sleep can impede progress toward a number of fitness-related goals. More specifically, it can negatively impact performance, appetite, body composition, and recovery. Insufficient sleep can be temporarily mitigated by caffeine and napping, and you can also modify your training program to try to salvage a good workout while you're currently underslept or you have a great deal of sleep debt. Uh, in addition, there are some dietary supplements that can favorably impact sleep. But nonetheless, the best thing you can do is focus on maintaining really, really good sleep hygiene in order to improve the quantity and the quality of your sleep. If sleep is getting between you and your fitness goals, you want to get right to the source and try to make your sleep better and sleep hygiene principles are the most straightforward way to do that. Now, before I end this episode, uh, I hope you'll once again afford me the opportunity to make a very shameless sales pitch on behalf of Macrofactor. That is the diet app that Greg and I co-developed along with a very talented team of colleagues. Uh, so imagine you're having some sleep disturbances. You might be thinking, uh, am I having too much caffeine? Am I consuming caffeine too late in the day? Am I eating too close to bedtime? My pre-bed meal, is it too large? Is it too fatty? Is it too spicy? Am I having too much alcohol before bed? As we've talked about, these are all things to consider if you're experiencing sleep disturbances. Well, that's easy. Just check Macro Factor, okay? So Macro Factor is a very efficient food logger with a robust verified food database but it logs your food on an actual hour-by-hour hour timeline. So rather than just putting your meals into the breakfast bucket or the lunch bucket or the dinner bucket, you actually have a timeline where you are logging not just what you ate and how much, but you are logging when you ate it. So that enables some of these time-related nutrition insights, and this is just one application of where that could come in handy. So as you consider the wide variety of diet approaches uh, and dietary strategies that you might implement in the new year, rest assured, Macro Factor is going to be able to facilitate most likely whatever you're planning to do. It's very efficient. It's very flexible. Uh, the coaching programs or the coached macro programs, I should say, are extremely flexible, but you can even use a collaborative program or a manual program to crank up the flexibility even higher. Whatever your food choice preferences are, whatever your macro preferences are, Macro Factor can handle it. So to learn more, check out macrofactorapp.com or you can just search for it in the app stores. As always, thank you for joining me. 
for another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. You might have noticed we've been doing a lot of episodes. We pushed right through uh, November, December, clear into January. We blew right through the typical winter holiday break that we normally take. So we're going to be taking a little break here. Uh, So the next few weeks, we're not going to have any episodes. I need to rest and recover and try to resolve some of this uh, stuff that's going on with the union. They're totally illegal, um, totally incorrect strike that they're doing. So keep an eye on our social media channels, uh, the Stronger by Science social media channels, uh, for more information about when our next season is going to begin. Until then, take care and good luck with all of your fitness goals. Thank you for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to sign up for our free newsletter to get concise breakdowns of relevant research, as well as 28 free training programs for all skill levels and all schedules. We hate spam just as much as you do, so we'll only email you when we have something really interesting to share with you. You can sign up for the free newsletter at strongerbyscience.com newsletter, or just go to the Stronger by Science homepage and click the free programs button at the top. If you want to join in on the Stronger by Science podcast conversation, be sure to check out our Facebook group and our subreddit. The links for both are provided in the description of today's episode. Finally, please remember that we are not medical doctors or registered dietitians. So before you make any changes to your exercise or nutrition habits, be sure to check with a qualified healthcare professional. Once again, thank you for listening, and we will be back soon with another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast.